Welcome to worship at Trinity Mullica Hill on this 23rd of August. It's hard to believe that August is almost over and with it summer is wrapping up. I hope that you get a chance to experience one more uh, last hurrah for summer before the school year kicks back and, and we get back into the rhythm, whatever that rhythm is going to look like in the days to come. I want you to hear this call to worship this morning from the 34th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them, as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements of the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Lord. I will search for the lost and bring them back. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful that as we gather this morning, wherever we happen to be today, we gather because you're the one who's gathered us. We come seeking you this morning because you came and sought for us. Even while we were lost, even while we were wandering, you came looking for us. And so we come today as a response to your love. We come today to give ourselves back to you as an offering of worship. And so we pray that in this time of worship, we'd lift you up and you would be exalted in our prayers and our praises and our songs. And in all that we do, God, your name would be lifted high because you alone are worthy. You are the good shepherd, the one who comes looking for his flock, the one who tends his flock and takes care of the flock, who protects them and watches over them. And we're grateful today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Hi, I'm Michael Smith, and I'm the pastor here at Trinity United Methodist Church in Malaga Hill. This week you should have received from me an email or a letter that describes a little bit more in detail about how we are trying to reopen our building for corporate worship. In order to do so, because of the size of our community, we're offering six different worshiping opportunities throughout the week. They are Tuesday at noon, Wednesday at 6 p.m., Thursday at at 6 p.m., Sunday morning at 9 and 11 a.m., and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. In order to make these services happen, we would need some help. Would you be willing to help serve at one of these different services to create that environment where people can gather safely for worship again in our building? Please reach out to us. So if you want more information about what's happening with the plan, check us out online at trinitymullockahill.org. There is the more detailed version of the plan, as well as a list of frequently asked questions about our reopening. If you'd like a hard copy of the plan, or would like to be added to our mailing list or email list, please reach out to us at office at trinitymullockahill.org, or give us a call at the number below. We are in prayer for you. We're here for you. And so while we continue in this online worship or in this online platform for the next couple weeks, we're doing our best to make sure that we're doing everything we can to gather safely in our building again. If you don't feel comfortable coming back to in-person worship in our building, that's cool. We totally understand that. That's why we're continuing in our online platforms. So look for more information in the next couple weeks not only about in-person gathering information, but also how we're going to continue to connect in a digital or online way. Let us know how we can support you in this time. Please reach out to us. Thank you.
Before we join our hearts in a word of prayer, hear these words from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Let us pray. Lord, we are in your good hands today. We find encouragement in your love. We remember who we are because you remind us and call us your own. We acknowledge our need today, our need for grace, our need for mercy, our need for forgiveness. And Lord, we are grateful that you are one who cares for us, who loves us, who transforms and continues to transform us. You draw our heart close to yours. And there is indeed a place of quiet rest that is near to your very heart. So as we draw close to you in this time of worship, we acknowledge that as we do so, we bring with us who we are, the fullness of who we are as your children, as your people today. We acknowledge our need Yet we also lift to you that which is on our hearts, our cares and our concerns for our friends and family, for our co-workers, for our neighbors. We lift to you, Lord, that which is on our hearts. Hear us. And as you hear us, grant to us a great measure of faith as we continue to live in this relationship of trust. You know our needs. You know that which we bring to you today as an act of faith, as an act of trust, as an act of prayer today. So we trust you. And in the areas of our doubt or unbelief, give a great measure of faith. As we are in darkness, shed your light. As we doubt, offer hope that we might be yours today. We have seen your salvation. We have seen your marvelous deeds, the power and the majesty of your hand of salvation. And you are good, and your love endures forever. Help us, Lord, as we walk this journey with you to remember that we are in your good hands, that you have saved us, that you care for us. Encourage our hearts today as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. 
my pleasure to read the scripture for you this morning, friends. We're reading uh, out of the NIV. We're reading uh, first chapter of John uh, 43 to 51. That's John 1, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Look at the picture of the Last Supper. Have you ever thought about who these people were? You've probably heard of some of the more out front disciples. St. Peter, James and John, Doubting Thomas, or Judas Iscariot, also known as the betrayer. But there were others at the table. In this series, we're gonna be looking at some of the others that Jesus invited to the table. And here's a hint, they're just like you and me. Thanks for joining us today. Let's learn more about who's at the table. When we look at the disciples, sometimes we get a little story of how they're involved in the ministry of Jesus. Sometimes we just get their name. Today's disciple that we're looking at is Philip. Now, Philip in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is only known to us just by the listing of his name in the listing of the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples. It's the Gospel of John that gives us a little bit more background on how Philip is involved. And for us as disciples or as followers of Jesus, we're often told that it's about us finding Jesus. And Philip's story is about Jesus finding him. In fact, in John's Gospel, three out of the four stories that are involving Philip are people that are looking for him. So Jesus comes, you heard from our scripture earlier, that Jesus comes and actually Jesus finds Philip. And actually, it's Philip that goes and finds Nathaniel, who we're talking about next week. But the interesting thing about how Philip then describes Jesus as, again, Jesus found Philip, is he says this, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now think about that for a moment. It's not just Jesus from Nazareth, but Jesus is also the son of Joseph. Philip loves details. And just contrast that with some of the other stories, the call stories of the disciples, or the other proclamations of the disciples about who Jesus is. Andrew went on to say, we found the Messiah, and that was enough. But not enough for Philip. Philip loved to share the detail. Just think about it. We found the one upon whom Moses wrote about in the law, the prophets, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Detailed description about who this Messiah is. So while we need the exclamatory passion of a Peter or an Andrew, we also in the church need the cautious precision of the Philips among us. So let's take a look at some of how Philip is involved in the ministry of Jesus. Think about Philip as someone who is detail-oriented and is precise. So in John chapter 6 is one of the stories of Philip. 
Now, it says in John chapter 6, verse 5, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I love this part of the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Because instead of making a statement of faith, which we believe sometimes as disciples we need to do, or right, we're called to do, we're called to have faith, we understand this, but I love his precision. And I think this is why Jesus finds him, or goes to Philip and you know, he doesn't go to, go to Peter or, or go to another disciple. Uh, he, he, he goes to the one that he knows is detail-oriented and precise. He goes to Philip. And Philip somehow does the calculation in his mind. He runs the algorithm. He looks at the crowd. He looks at, you know, uh, where in the world, how do we logistically get this done? And he says, it's going to take eight months' wages. It's going to take that much in order just to feed these people, for them to get a bite. His, look, his head's not in the clouds. And he, he's not necessarily negative about this. Like, hey, let's, he doesn't say, let's get out of here and let them just fend for themselves. He calculates it up. He answers Jesus' question. Jesus knows to find Philip in a moment like this. Philip, what is this going to take? And, and, and it invites this miracle to happen. Now, Jesus knew that because he had compassion on the crowd, he was going to be doing something like this, but he engages his disciple in this miracle in the way that fits best for Philip. And Philip is involved in this story. We know who he is because he is the one from John's gospel that says, it's going to take this much. He calculates it up. And while we celebrate the miracles of God in our midst, Right, the big stuff, the feeding of the 5,000s. We remember how God provides manna that falls from the sky. The truth is, in our, our world, we need Phillips. We know that thousands are going to be fed because people like Philip are willing to count the cost and to make it happen. They do that work. They figure it out, and they know when to step out of the way and let someone else take the lead and for Jesus to do his work. Just right after his pronouncement, here's what happens. Uh, eight months wages, right? Then another disciple. Again, look how different disciples are getting. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he says, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, uh, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus says, sit him down, watch what I do. I love how Jesus takes the great proclamation or hope of Andrew that says, well, here's something that we could use, but uh, after he even says it out loud, what good is that going to do? But he takes that Philip as well. He gets both of them there in this conversation for this miracle to happen. He works with his disciples and meets them where they are. He finds Philip to say, Philip, how do we get this done? What's this going to take? How can you shed your light, take your detailed, oriented, precise mind and bring it into this story? That's what Jesus does with all of us. He brings us into the story, even the Philips among us. In John chapter 12, we see a group of Greeks approach Philip. Here's what it says in John chapter 12, verse 20. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip. Right? They found Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Uh, let me stop there and just say this. So while the Greeks approach Philip, why? Philip is a Greek name, actually. It's not a very common first century Jewish name. It's a Greek name in the midst of this band of disciples. So you could see why this group of Greeks go to Philip. But here's something powerful of what happens in this story. Remember, we talked about how Philip is precise and detail-oriented. And while he's careful and precise, he also doesn't get in the way. He's deliberate, right? He wants to do his research with the feeding of the 5,000, but he's also not an obstructionist with his details. 
Because the Greeks come to him, and you'd think, oh, I'm very important. They come to me. He says, no, no, no. I know who to take you to to get to Jesus. He knows enough about himself that if he's detail-oriented, but an Andrew, who's one of the 12 as well, is, you know, there's just something about the way he calculated, and he said, i got to talk to Andrew about this. We, i, I got to get Andrew, and then him and Andrew together take these Greeks to go see Jesus. And I wonder what they were talking about, what Andrew's mind and also what Philip's mind brought into that conversation of, what do we do with these folks that want to meet Jesus? And they do all of this. He's, he's not an obstructionist. He doesn't let the detail and the careful precision of his mind get in the way in the bigger end game goal of where he wants to get people to Jesus. Sometimes details can get in the way. We can get so busy counting the cost that we actually never do something with it. We can have a paralysis by analysis. So don't let your particularity or your precision, which are good things, don't let it get in the way of what actually needs to get done. Philip is going to teach us this. Philip understands this. That's why when the Greeks came to him, he went to Andrew, and they both went to Jesus. In John chapter 14, Jesus is talking with his disciples. It's the last night of his life, right, in ministry with them, and he just said some challenging things, and he begins the 14th chapter with, right, this beautiful phrase, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because in the previous chapter, he'd said some really challenging things, and they were nervous and scared. And he begins to go in John chapter 14 to say some incredible things about who he is. Let's pick up where Philip comes into the story. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Here's where Philip comes in in this next verse in verse 8. Remember, detail-oriented, precise. This is perfect moment for him. And what a powerful statement he says. Philip said in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Simple. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, okay, um, just show us then. But here's what Jesus does next. Here, here's what happens. Do you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for so long, or for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This opened up the door for one of the most powerful witnesses of our faith. When you see me, you see the Father, and that's enough. If it wasn't for his detail-orientedness, for his precision, I appreciate the people that just make statements like that, that just ask those questions or make those comments for Jesus then to be able to explain or show us again, hey, remember who I am. Don't forget, do, do, you, not, do you not see it yet? Do you not get it yet? When you see me, you get it all. Okay, so we've just learned a couple stories about where people are searching for Philip, where people find Philip in order to help, you know, whether it's a problem to be solved or they want to get to Jesus, or in fact, Jesus himself in Philip's call story that goes to him. And I know so much of what we talk about in the church is about us finding God, that we need to seek and we need to search. But there's a part of Philip's story that I appreciate so much that reminds us that in our searching and in our finding, you need to hear about a God who searches for you. Jesus finds you. So many times we talk about believing in Jesus. And I wonder if we switched it up. Do you know that Jesus believes in you? So we have to think differently about some of these things. We know that we're supposed to love God. Let me remind you again that God finds us. God believes in us. And God loves us. In our tradition, we talk about 
accepting Christ. But did you know that Christ accepts you? So again, while you may be searching, you may be trying to find, you may be trying to discover everything there is, you need to hear that there is a God that is searching for you, that is trying to find you. I think about the day when Philip was there and Jesus comes to him. You know, there's probably moments of your life, if you reflect upon it, where you weren't searching, yet still Jesus found you. You may feel like there's someone in your life right now that they may be far from God, that they may not know what the next thing to do in their life to be. They're searching. And I want them to hear again this word of comfort that even in the moments when we aren't aware or we aren't searching, sometimes Jesus just gets to where we are. That's what he did with Philip. I believe that's what he can do with us. So even though you may not be searching, Jesus is searching for you. Philip might not have been trying to find Jesus, but Jesus found Philip. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for the stories of these disciples that shape our experiences as well. I thank you for those that can connect with a person like Philip and see a little bit of their story in his life as well. But we pray, Lord, that with all of our detailed drivenness, that it may not get in the way of this mystery and this powerful movement called your kingdom. We are not able to figure out everything in this life, but we trust you. And as much as we try to figure out and have all the answers and to discern and understand what will be, we thank you for the times where you come to us. We thank you that you're always willing to come to us now, even right now, to find us. You find us as we are. You love us, you accept us, and you call us your own. So while we may be searching, first today we thank you that you're willing to find us. In Jesus' name we pray. Just to you, Lord. Turn.